Well, hello and welcome back, or welcome to those of you tuning in for the first time to Hope Revealed. I'm your host, Matt Crump, and I come to you every Tuesday with episodes of Hope, Help, and Health. You can expect guests to give us great information and insight in the world of business, health, and personal experience, all presented to you as a way to find a Hope Revealed. As a person myself who's been battling stage four cancer, I wanted to bring a platform to you that would specifically bring hope as well as help. That can be done through our special guests, information I've been able to locate, and information from emails and messages I receive from you, our followers. You can always email us here at community at godsgotthis.love for questions, comments, or content. On today's episode, we're going to talk with video agency owner Andrew Helm for some powerful insight in his life, his business, and how it can all apply to you. Welcome to Hope Revealed. I'm always telling my clients, especially the ones who have never gotten into video before on social media, and they're like, I have no idea what to create. And in my head, I'm always telling them, you just want to find things that are interesting to you for whatever reason. And you don't even have to know what you're going to make that content into today. And it may be nothing, but if you just go out and capture that and then create a backlog of content that you can go through at a later date, whenever you are feeling like you're, you don't have the creative juices going, you're going to find something in there that you can latch onto and create some content around. My name is Andrew Helms. I'm the founder of Feral Flicks. We are a video agency. We help people tell their story to the world. Hey guys, welcome back, and we're so excited to have our friend Andrew here with us today. And you've heard a little bit about what he does uh, on the front side here, and we're going to dig into that a little bit. It is uh, it's pretty awesome, uh, the journey that he has been on. And, um, you know, he didn't, he wasn't born like a video guy. He wasn't, ah, he, he had a video camera and out the game. No. He, he's actually learned some of this stuff, like all of us have to do. And he is amazing at what he does. So I'd love to dig into that some today. And then some other things that uh, are really powerful about his life and story that you, you may not be aware of that uh, we'll definitely be able to share with you something that this show is all about. And that is Hope Revealed. So welcome, Andrew. Appreciate you coming to the show today. Wow, I appreciate the kudos. I'm feeling yeah, good. Man. I'm so excited. And we've been talking about it for a little while. And I'm glad we're finally here to, to get the show done. And you are, you're out, out west, right? I am. I went out west. I started in, well, I've had a, a, a journey where I went all over the U.S., but uh, I've gone all the way from living in D.C. to now I live all the way out in California. Um, I just, I love moving. I love change. <laughs> I love moving. So you live in an RV basically is what you're saying, right? I, I want to, I'm trying to convince my wife to get, Oh my gosh, house. you're not the tiny house guy. Are you? Oh yeah. I would love a tiny house, but three kids, wife, and <laughs> huge dog. My dog yeah. is bigger than me. He weighs more than I do. So, uh, I'm not it doing makes so for a real tiny house life. right there. That's for sure. <laughs> I've got a lot of convincing to do, but that is, that is actually the goal. I'm like, I would just rather like to travel, have a mobile studio and be able to just like pop up in people's towns and be like, all right, I'm here. Let's do yes. something together. That would be actually so fun. I would, I'm dreaming right there with you. I can imagine this huge bus RV, the stuff, and then the side pops out and there's your studio and then the, 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 the editing studios in the back awesome the wife's driving the rv <laughs> you could talk to people and the <laughs> and clean in right dog brings your slippers it's amazing dream i think I'm, <laughs> I'm with you andrew that's the end of the show folks we're going on a road trip <laughs> let's do it let's do it well man um there's there's a lot of stuff that's happened in your life already and uh last i checked you said you're what 75 years old right yeah very old yeah you feel it but you're you're 30 <laughs> years old right 30 and uh, you've been able to accomplish a lot of things in those 30 years. And uh, there have been some things in your life that uh, you told me about that have no doubt put some, some age on you. Now, I know there's a lot of people that are watching today. They want to learn about business and about what you do with video. And I want to talk about that a little bit first, but then I'd like to get into some of, of what you share with me uh, before we were starting the show today about some things that happened in your life personally. But um, what is one of the things that really drew you into into video. I mean, you did, did you start off digging that kind of stuff or is that something that was introduced to you or how did it, how did it come into your life like that? Well, I am in a, I feel like I'm a very Americanized uh, kid. So I watched a lot of movies growing up and, and TV 
um, didn't realize at the time that I had a passion for um, video per se. I think the thing that really has always been with me, even when I was a young kid, was storytelling. I read a ton when I was a kid. In fact, anytime I would ever get in trouble, the one thing I had left to me was reading. That was mm -hmm. the one thing that like wouldn't get pulled away or taken away. And so it was always kind of that retreat, that escape for me when I was really little. And I would read stories and I would, I would hate how they ended. I would like, I want to rewrite it basically. <laughs> and so I would do that. I would rewrite my own stories. I actually found out a lot, a lot later when I went into my undergrad degree and I started studying creative writing, I read a book by Stephen King and he talks about his childhood and what he used to do is he used to go to a horror movies. Um, he'd sneak in, basically watch these movies, and then he'd go home and he'd, he'd write them. He wouldn't even rewrite them. He'd write them um, basically word for word what he had just seen in the movie theater, but in a story form. And so I always saw that and I was like, ooh, I've got something related to Stephen King. Like we've got this connection point on story <laughs> though. But that was it. So, I mean, I went to college for four years and I spent four years writing novels and getting these things torn to shreds by my peers Mm. And other people who are just reading them and, and, you know, you go into that thinking you're good. You think like, you know, when you're a kid, you write, you don't know a lot of other people that write and you just think, Hey, I'm doing it and I enjoy it. So everybody else must enjoy it. Everybody must enjoy it. That's right. <laughs> um, so that you go through that and it's, it's, uh, I mean, I would not recommend it for people who actually like writing. Like now that I've gone through it, I think technically wise, yes, it's going to give you a lot of good information, but like that environment will actually tear you down. I mean, I mean, four years of just getting beaten down on what you loved uh, originally. But I did that. Then I was interning at a, a voice talent management company and I was listening to audible audiobooks and um, critiquing the author and giving them feedback on how they should say something. Maybe they you know, mispronounced things like that. I was only contracting with them and they liked what I was doing so much that they brought me on as a project manager. And I managed this huge project with audible but eventually that project ran out and they still liked me, uh, but they didn't have that type of work for me anymore. And so they basically hired an audio engineer in that studio to start teaching me audio engineering. Wow. So then I started working on um, commercials, um, things where we would be getting um, translation. So uh, like I remember one uh, Victoria's Secret was, was doing uh, like training teaching people in their store how to like measure for bra size and things like that. Did you volunteer for that position then I guess is what happened? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I got lots of really good experience. And <laughs> <laughs> folks figuring it's a whole different program now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was my first, I think foray specifically into video and I wasn't really doing anything with video. I was focused on the audio, but eventually after I graduated, I moved into instructional design. So I was des designing online learning experiences. I was designing brochures, um, things that were printed. So I, I started getting more visual in how I was telling the story and how I was communicating information. To so people would you so say that, that it was the Victoria's Secret's job that got you to go from the audio to visual? You get more visual at the video. At the <laughs> yeah, I was like, screw audio. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the images. Um, oh, sorry, folks. Sorry. <laughs> so I did that. I did instructional design. and then. I got really good at instructional design. I went and got my master's in instructional design and technology. And I did that for three different companies, saw three different, completely different sides of it. Eventually, um, I moved from doing like screen shares like this, where I'd be training people on how to use software to leveraging animation. So I was getting into uh, Adobe After Effects and like character animation, just different things like that. And then I moved into the last company and I finally picked up the video camera. and. I don't even know what drew me to the video camera specifically other than it felt like another thing like that I could add to my repertoire of things that I could do. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it at the time, but it was actually like this precipice of everything that I'd been spending the last 15 years learning around storytelling and plot and strategy from when I'm working in the business to um, audio to visual, like all of it now came together in one place when I thought about okay, how can I leverage this video to get a result somewhere? Because I would start shooting videos for uh, a company and they might have some sort of messaging. I remember one that I did, which was like a huge collaboration effort where I basically went around this company, um, multiple different sites and I interviewed people on camera and I just asked them one question. I said, what do you love about your job? Mm. And I, I took all those together, put them together and I released that and it went viral at the company. 8,000 <laughs> person company basically. And I think everybody saw it. 
And it was at that point where I realized, oh, hey, I'm onto something here. I can make something that doesn't have to be incredibly time consuming for myself because I already know all these little ins and outs, the intricacies of how to build it. And then I can get some massive results from it. And so I think that's the piece where, man, it just really transformed. And that's when I started my business because I was like, man, I want to be doing this. I want to be doing this a lot more than what I'm doing it right now because it wasn't a main priority or a responsibility for my um, job. And in fact, when I got too good at it and I started getting asked to do it all the time at the company, my managers were telling me, hey, you can't do video anymore because it's taking you away from all these other responsibilities. <laughs> that's how much people wanted to start leveraging me to do the video. And so that's when I just, I knew I was onto something. Yeah, that's amazing. And of course, the, the journey, obviously, you know, we know some of this now from the end of the beginning, but all the places that you're at along your journey, that really got you to a place where you never even thought about starting from in the first place. And it, it just ends up being something now that you're able to do. Uh, actually, you're actually scaling that up to another area as well now with what you do in your own business and being able to um, identify stories and help people with their stories and to tell great stories. So it's, it's back to some of that writing aspect really that you had in your life and really digging into that and, and helping people to know how to do some of the same things you're doing, uh, which is pretty amazing. So uh, I think you're pretty happy, you think, at this point, right, with what you're able to do. <laughs> and, uh, and you told me that one of the things you really, really like to do now is to, is to really do things for others, to help others, right? For sure. That, that, so what's, I mean, what's that like for you? Let's help, unpack that a little bit. What's it like what do you mean by helping others? Is that like you, you coach somebody or, or what's, it, what's that look like? Man, it, I think it looks different for everybody. And, and to be honest, you know, for me, that goes even beyond my business. I, I'm looking for opportunity. I mean, so I carry this money in here. I never used to carry money, but I working in downtown LA, there is a huge homeless population. And I get asked all the time while I'm down there, you know, for money while I'm walking through. And I never used to carry cash. So I always had to tell people no, but I also had this, um, you know, I had this, I don't even know what I would call it. Almost like this rule that I lived by that if somebody asked me for help and I could do it, that I would. And so I kept getting asked by people and I did have the means to help them, right? They're asking me for a buck, right? Two bucks. Like I can do that, but I didn't have it on me. I wasn't setting myself up to actually help them. And yeah, so I yeah. switched that one behavior so that I always have cash in my wallet now. I don't spend that cash. That's cash is just for when people ask me for cash. That's um, really awesome. By the way, well, can I have five bucks, bro? I need about five bucks right now. <laughs> yeah, <you> got it, man. <laughs> Why aren't it your way right now? Thank you. <laughs> so I, I think I've always lived my life that way. In fact, a lot of people that have been closer to me have almost said to my detriment that, you know, I let people walk over me because I'm like, I'm quick to forgive. I'm quick to forget. I'm I want to be helpful to people. Like that's well, I think what's interesting about like. that, you bring up a great point. It's a good, good segue. It, some folks may have problems with that. I understand. I, uh, I, I have a, a ministry myself, and one of the first ministries I had when I lived in this town in Fayetteville was we had a, a, a little coffee shop, and it was a homeless outreach center. And uh, in our little downtown area, there were 300 homeless people that lived in the woods. Um, so we would feed them and stuff like that. I'm not saying it for kudos, but uh, I was able to learn certain things about homeless folks. And um, on the front side, I would just blow people off. You know, oh, you're just a drug addict. Oh, you're just an alcoholic. Oh, you just want your next fix, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And then I started learning some things about people. I also had a sense of understanding when some people were actually trying to take me for a ride and uh, when some people really needed the help. And I really tried to, to appeal to that side of my, my heart as well. But for you, it goes even deeper than the kind of experience that I have. Uh, your experience is, uh, is, is a street experience like legit part of your story is like you actually didn't even have a home in a part, part of your life right it's, it's you okay with sharing some of that story with us today for sure yeah so i moved out of my parents house when i was 16 and so i lived you know between some you know more distant relatives to with my friends I really spent my time as that transplant. This is, I think, also why I have this innate nature in me to want to move around because I'm just, I loved being able to do that. I loved being able to pick up on a whim and go somewhere else and, and live a different life and do it, do it differently. Yeah. And I did that at 16, from like 16 to 19. You know, I, I, we were staying at this house. It was like this huge party house. Um, bands would come into town and play shows and then they would come here and this would be like where the after party was and this would be where everybody crashed nobody paid rent 
nobody did any, like it was just a house that people lived in. Um, and so we were all living in this house. The girl that owned this house was pretty cool with all of us. Um, one day she decided, well, I'm not even really entirely sure how this actually played out, but she basically made everybody get out of the house. She said, everybody leave. <laughs> My dad's coming over to check on the house. I have to get this house cleaned up. You guys can't be here. Right. And so everybody leaves thinking like, oh, you know, maybe we might come back in a day or two. So we're all just kind of like crashing on couches here and there. And then, you know, everybody, not everybody, but, you know, some people started to fall back into that house and I didn't. And I, I basically felt like I got kind of like pushed out, like I was on this outside bubble of what was going on in that house and I didn't have any place to stay. And so I actually ended up, you know, moving from couch to couch until eventually, you know, there was no more couches to go to. And one night I found myself legitimately outside. I've got a job, right? Not like a fancy thing. I work at Taco Bell, but it's like, I literally have no place to stay. And uh, eventually the um, girl who owned that car, their parents came to get it. I'd like never forget because I'm sleeping in the back and I hear like this tap, 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 somebody knocking on the door. And I'm basically getting evicted. Who's ringing my doorbell? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm basically getting evicted, right? Yeah. Um, from, from this house that I have. Um, and they're telling me like, they got to take this car. So they're like, you know, impound, they're not impounding, but like they're getting rid of it. Right. They're, they've got to get out. They, they own the car. They can't leave it there. They have to get rid of it. So then the next thing I know, I'm like, I'm legitimately now living outside. I was like, this place was kind of close to a bridge. I like, like had no idea where to go other than like it would rain. Right. This was Utah with snow, things like that. And so I had to get out of the elements. And so I was legitimately living under a bridge. It was like the most stereotypical homeless scenario ever it's like i'm homeless and i'm living under a bridge oh my gosh <laughs> and so like this went on this this whole summer my and what's funny is my wife today she was my my girlfriend at the time and she stuck with me through you know the months before when i was living in that party house to living in the car living under the bridge to eventually i had saved up enough money from working at taco bell and all the overtime that i'd put in to actually pay a deposit down to rent a room out of somebody's house. And it took that entire summer to basically reset myself to a place where I felt like, okay, I've got this. I can do something a little bit different. And my wife was truly that, that rock for me that, you know, if I, if she hadn't been there, I don't know what I would have done. Like I wouldn't even, I wouldn't have even been in the right mindset to try and get out of what I was in. Because for me, it was all about, I've got to get better for her, right? I've got to get better so that, you know, she'll still want to be with me and that like we can develop our relationship. And she was already doing some amazing things too, because she had just graduated high school. She was getting ready to go to college. I had dropped out of high school and college wasn't even like a blip in my mind at the time. And I saw her doing that. And she gave me the confidence to say, man, maybe I can go out and go to school. And it wasn't that I thought I was, I was dumb or anything like that. I thought I, you know, I had a very good self-confidence in my intelligence level. It was just, I didn't have any hope that that would bring me anything positive in my life. And mm. I saw somebody else doing it. And I saw the positivity that it was bringing to her life. And that encouraged me to go out and start doing that. And so that's like, it was like, I was homeless that summer. I finally got a room to rent. I enrolled in college that next semester and then it just took off from there. And then the opportunity started coming in. And then, you know, we get back to that path that I walked through where it was like, you know, interning at an audio studio, graduating, getting a job as an instructional designer, getting another job, getting another job, finally picking up video, finally like owning a business so that I can now help other people get out of their rut, like whatever those ruts are. But it was like that one moment where, I don't know if it's a moment, but that one summer where I was like at rock bottom. Yeah. And, basically gave me the motive. And, and honestly, I needed that rock bottom. I'd spent the last three years doing absolutely nothing with my life um, other than hanging out and enjoying, enjoying my life with my friends. Um, but like, I wasn't getting anywhere. I wasn't doing anything. I definitely wasn't achieving my mission of helping anybody, right? I was doing nothing for anybody but myself because you know when you're in that type of situation, really all you can focus on is yourself because you have so many of your own problems. Right, but right. now that I'm through that, now I can look backwards and see how all of those things have helped to build me up to where I am today and how I can leverage that information to help other people in whatever part of their journey that they're in today. No, that's so good, man. There's a lot of, a lot of little ways we can dig into that and, and have like 10 more shows on some different things you brought up there. But um, yeah, the one thing you brought up there a minute ago about hitting rock bottom and it's not really, it's really, it's when you're in the pits when you're down in the deep parts and the deep pits is when you can really mine for gold. 
And a lot of folks, before they get to the gold, they're ready to, to bail, get out. And you're right where the gold was and you missed it, right? And for you, fortunately, you were able to get some gold. And it sounds like uh, your wife, your girlfriend at the time was, was someone who was one of the miners in the shaft there with you and uh, helped you really to, to find the gold that you were, you were looking for. And now, now look at you. You got this cool house that's got three kids and a giant dog and you're ready to buy an RV trailer and hit the road. That's killer, dude. <laughs> yeah. And I think, it's a, I think it's a good highlight of how important it is for other people to realize the impact that they have. Because a lot of times you will see something like that and, and like, you know, the situation where I give money to homeless people, I actually have one that I always go down to eat somewhere and I never finish my food and I know that she's super hungry. So rather than throwing my food out, I kind of like separate it out so that it's not gross. Right. Like it's like legitimately good. <laughs> here. You want this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'll, I'll bring it to her. Right. Cause I never eat all my lunch anyways. They usually give me way too many portions, like too big of portions. And so like doing little things like that, to me, when I was going through that situation, I noticed every single little thing that people did for me. And I remembered it, right? I still remember the little things that people did for me. I had a manager at that Taco Bell who was in like a bad relationship with uh, his wife. And so they were just fighting all the time. And he, like, there's no way she would ever let me stay at his house because that's just not the type of person she was. But he would sneak me in whenever he thought he could to get me into his room, especially if like, it was like a snowy night or like it was really bad, something was going, going on, he didn't want me to be outside or like I hadn't showered in a week and he wanted to give me a place to shower. He would be like timing it so that she wasn't there so that I could come in and do that, right? And like things like that have stuck with me over time where I don't even know if he realizes how much I appreciate him and appreciate what he did for me at that stage of my life, even though for him it was probably like these little simple things. To me, it was a huge thing. Yeah. Like getting a shower after a week of not showering I don't think people realize like you go a week without showering, you've been outside and you like peel your socks off and your socks don't come off full anymore. Like pieces of your socks are fused to your skin because the sweat is just like molded yeah. it together. Cause you work at Taco Bell too. On top of that, <laughs> you have to like scrape those things off and like you're doing it. And you're like, man, this is crazy. Yeah. People just live this year in and year out. So even the little things I think have a huge impact on people's confidence, their perception of themselves, their, uh, you know, their, their desire to want to get out of that situation and get themselves into a better situation. I think we have so much more influence over that than we think we do. Yeah. Do you think that experience made you more compassionate then? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, I probably would have had similar sentiments, um, you know, around, you know, homeless people just, you know, yeah, I think it's, just, it's magnified. I think that's part of your character. It's part of who you are naturally, but I think that it got magnified. I think you really, it really means a lot to you. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I'm just always now, there's always two sides to every story, right? And I think a lot of times people can get polarized on thinking like it must be this way and that's the way it is because I perceive it to be that way. And I just know I've seen, I mean, this is just one scenario, but I've been on, you know, opposite ends of so many different scenarios in my life to know that there's always two sides to the story and everybody always thinks they're the hero in the story, right? Mm. There are no bad guys. There are, you know, the people that think they're good because of this and the people that think they're good because of this. And so I'm always just looking at what's, what's the other angle to this? How could somebody else perceive the same situation? Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. So as a guy who's uh, thinking about videography and recording and stuff, because I, mean, I have a passion for it too. I'm not anywhere near as good as you. But the idea of doing something like that would be, from your perspective, a guy who is interested in being able to tell both sides of the story. And do you, you think you're able to do that with what you do? Do you do that? Or is it something subconsciously? Do you think about it in the way that you tell your stories? I think I, I probably think about it a little differently. So there's this concept of heroes having two stories. When, you, when you're getting into writing, you, you'll learn this concept. But essentially, you have the story that you see, and then you have the story that you don't see. And the movies that do really well at the box office, the ones that people really resonate with, are the ones that really nail that subconscious story. Um, the ones that don't do so well, they focus on this top story, and then people get to the end, and they're like not really emotionally invested into it. But that's how I kind of think about these two stories you know when i'm thinking about one person there's like the thing that we see that we think we understand about this person like what they're doing i mean you can look at me and say oh he's running a video business right I, I see this i see that he's trying to grow his video business i see he's trying to help people with the video business but you maybe don't see the thing underneath it which is you know i'm trying to build a legacy i'm trying to build something that my family can 
take part in, that we can mm -hmm. grow as a family together as we're going through this journey of, of life and trying to build something so that I can spend more of my time with them, but also be serving the people out in the world even more. Like I'm trying to build this value up so that when I get to, you know, the day when I'm in my box at my funeral and people are giving the eulogy about me, you know, they're saying, Andrew told the types of stories that changed the world and he helped people win no matter what. And like, I want that huge room of people there that are, are saying that, right. And they're agreeing, right. They're standing up. They're like, yes, man, this man changed my life. He did things for me. So that's the story that I think is under here that we don't always tell. That's so good, bro. That's just so good. Oh man, we lost our video. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you, I'm, uh, we froze out. <laughs> I, that rocked, is such a, I rocked the video so hard that I had the blah. Dude, it was so <laughs> awesome. The video was going freak out. It was like, yeah, it was awesome. So Dude, that's really great. That's awesome. I, I'm passionate about legacy. Uh, I won't go there because we'll be talking for another half an hour. But yeah, I'm totally with you on that one. So kind of kind of getting through some of the layers that we've had here and coming towards the end of what you're doing right now, the end of the, our time together. Uh, there's a lot of things you talked about with, uh, with your passion for business that you started off with, kind of your process of how you've come along over the years to where you're at today. And then we went back into the story to find out some of those things that were that were core of what's really created uh, who Andrew is today. Some of those people that have come along your side to help you, specifically your wife, a girlfriend at the time, wife now. Um, so if somebody, uh, well, if somebody, there is at least hopefully a couple people are gonna watch this, that uh, <laughs> when those folks that are watching right now that are, are thinking about, you know, they tuned in because they're, they're into video or maybe, you know, some of the business aspect that we're going to be talking about with, with how, how businesses work and how, how the ins and outs of what you've been able to do for your business works. Um, everybody has a, the two layers, right? There's that one that you see and one that you don't see, like you just talked about. So the one that, that we may not see right now, that person that's watching and doesn't let us see that layer, we might see, see that one, but we all know that there's another one because they don't have some of the things you're talking about right now. They, uh, they, they might be afraid to tell people. They, uh, maybe they don't know the right questions to ask. You know, I don't know. Through your experiences, what's, what's something that you could share with the, with the folks today that would be like what your girlfriend did for you? What is what is that grain of hope, that thing that you could share with somebody that may be what it takes for this person watching right now to say, yeah, Andrew, you're right. I'm, I'm going to do this. What would that be for you to share with that person right now? Not to put you on the spot or anything, but. <laughs> yeah, I always do these. and I'm like, man, I want to give like the best advice. That I, I know. Just, just, just shoot from the um, heart, bro. I think, I think it's so hard when you're going through life and you want to get to a certain place. And you see other people who are in that place for us to realize that we can get there because we may just see somebody who seems like they're so high up here that we'd never be able to reach it. And so we have this um, action paralysis where we don't take the little steps that we need to take to get there um, in the future. And so I do this all the time with clients who are scared or nervous about being on video and it's, it's legitimately just do it. You don't have to be perfect. In fact, it's better to not be perfect, better to be imperfect and more consistent and build yourself up time and time again. Quit going for the huge wins. Quit trying to, I mean, if you're running a business, quit trying to land your six figure single client, right? Those will come, but you should be focused on the little wins that you can get because those little wins are going to start adding up and become big wins. And that's exactly what it was for me. It wasn't a big win that got me out of being homeless. It was busting my ass, working overtime at Taco Bell for three months straight, finding the right place to rent, renting it, applying for college. I went to a community college before I went to the real college, right? All of these were little tiny steps that you will never see because when you look at me today, you're probably just looking at the last five, 10 videos I did, maybe my website, and it just looks like, oh, this is amazing. And, and imagine it from my perspective. I look at people who are you know, five years ahead of me and I go like, oh man, mine is nothing compared to what they're doing. But I have to keep that in mind that I'm taking those steps to get there. And nothing, nothing overcomes hard work day in and day out. Yeah. Some people get lucky. They, they hit a jackpot, right? They hit the lottery and they immediately pop up there. But for most people, that's not the case. And, and to be honest, I don't know that I even would want that. I would, I'd, I'd much rather build it the way that I'm building it today. Yeah because then it means something, right? It was not easily won, so I'm not gonna easily lose it versus people who win the lottery easily, you know, typically easily lose that money. Um, I wanna work hard for something that I want to last, not even just my lifetime, but beyond my lifetime. 
And if you're after that type of impact, you have to put in the work and make it, make it something that you are passionate about doing all the time, little steps. So don't worry about the big things, worry about the little things you can do. Mm. There you go, folks. We're back down the mine and we are just digging up some gold today. So that's pretty awesome, Andrew. Thanks for that. And uh, it's true. I, I think that, you know, I'd like to just kind of go on what you just said there, knowing that what he just brought up is definitely how people feel. And it's lonely. I know how lonely it is and can be when you feel like nobody's listening and nobody cares what you have to say. And it feels like you never will get there. Everybody, I think everybody has gone through that. Like you said, there's a few, those jerks. I mean, there's a few that get to just go straight to the top. But for the rest of us, you know, scum, we have to work our way to the top, right? But you're so right. It's those places that we, that we strive, that we work hard through, that we struggle through, that, that really help us to become the best that we can be. And when you've worked so hard for something and you've worked so hard to get to it, there's no way anybody could talk you out of the process that it took to get there. You know exactly what it took to get there, right? And then it's very easy to be able to communicate to other people how to do what you did. When you're just given something, there's no way to communicate that to folks. Well, I don't know. I just, I'm, I won the lottery. <laughs> I'm rich. Woo! <laughs> you know, just not how it works. So that's such great, great stuff, Andrew. And uh, again, uh, tell us again the name of your, your, your business and your website and stuff like that for us to be able to find that. Uh, feral Flicks. Feral like the cat. Flicks yes. like Netflix. Feral Flicks. Feralflicks.com. Super easy. Um, yeah. You can check out on LinkedIn. That's Facebook. All this. No doubt. I'll have all that stuff down here somewhere or, or over here. It, it always never can tell because it's backwards. And I put it down there and I'm like, man, I should have pointed the other way. So it's, <laughs> it's over here. <laughs> ah. All right. So we'll have all that up here shortly. So thanks so much, Andrew, for spending some time with us. And I really hope that you get so successful that you live in a 300 square foot house one day and you're the happiest guy on the planet Earth because you like these little tiny houses with these <laughs> little, little tiny people. As long as your kids are small, you should probably be doing okay, right? But uh, yeah. I think you're destined for a whole lot bigger. Yeah. You're destined for a whole lot more than that. You think you're going to leave California one day? Uh, I mean, for fun, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Cause your kids are born there now, right? That's home. Yeah. They, yeah. They've lived here for a while now. So. Yeah. No doubt. It's home. I never thought my kids would be, uh, I live in Fayetteville, North Carolina and I love this place, but, uh, home of Fort Bragg, woo, woo, largest military base in the world. But I never thought I'd be able to say, I thought about it the other day. Yeah. My kids were born and raised in Fayetteville, North Carolina. That just sounds weird for me to say. I was like, <laughs> I wanted to say like, there are, yeah, my kids were born in Hollywood or they were born in, in Nashville or, you know, nope, Fayetteville, North Carolina. Yeehaw. <laughs> but you know, home's where you hang your, hang your heart, right? So it's pretty awesome to, to enjoy home with our families. And, and you get to do that, my friend. It's amazing where you have been taken in your journey uh, from some places that haven't been so good for you in your past to now have an incredible family that loves each other and you have an opportunity to share a legacy with them and the world that um, had you given up and just um, cashed in at Taco Bell, you might just still be at Taco Bell right now. Right. <laughs> yeah. You would have stunk too. Been pretty bad. You know, shower, Taco Bell, peeling his socks right. off. That's not good advertisement for Taco Bell, knowing the guy in the back who was cooking was peeling his socks off the night before. But it's a pretty amazing <laughs> story, my friend. Pretty amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew, so much for being with us today. And again, I'll share his information so you guys can get in contact with him. You have a whole group of people there that work with you now too, and you can help do uh, do stuff for folks with marketing and and video work and things like that, right? Definitely, I'm your guy. Yeah, so if folks want to figure out how to do that, they can get in contact with you and you can help them to get their story told through, uh, through video. i love to. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Thanks again, Andrew. Appreciate you being here today. Awesome. Thank you. I hope and pray today has been a blessing to you. And before we go, I want to share a great scripture from Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He's done. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and dear sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what's true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you've learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. 
And that he surely will, my friends. I hope and pray you have a better view of hope this week. That being said, don't give in, don't give up, and know that in every life there is a hope revealed.